you all. I'm happy to, to be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about engagement. Uh, how many? I wrote a medium post about this not that long ago. Just show of hands. Did anybody see it? Okay. So good. For most of you, this will be new. Um, this is a very consumer-oriented presentation. It's about engagement in non-transactional consumer businesses, although I, people have told me that it's relevant for software as a service companies, it's relevant a little bit for transactional businesses, but like 80% of it is really about uh, non-transactional consumer companies, we're just putting that out there. Um, but, um, but so what, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, and my name is Sarah, I'm one of the partners at, at Greylock. Um, I'm going to be talking about engagement and how uh, in my experience, engagement is the fuel powering uh, many, if not most, of the enduring multi-billion dollar businesses in this kind of non-transactional class. Uh, so what I'll do is I will do the shortest background on Greylock and me you've ever heard. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about something that I call uh, the hierarchy of engagement. Um, and I'll be finishing with what I think is the most important metric to to measure. Uh, for you guys, you're all super early, um, and this will be probably something where the, the metric itself is not yet useful for you. It depends on, on what stage you are, but it is absolutely the thing that you will want to monitor uh, as your company gets more mature, so it's really important uh, to keep an eye on it. Um, okay, so Greylock. Um, so you know, at Greylock, like the reason, part of the reason why I've been thinking about this, um, this topic is that you know, at Greylock, we obsess over building enduring multi-billion dollar businesses. Uh, and I, I learned this crazy fact recently, which is that there are only five companies that were founded since 2000 that are public and now worth more than 10 billion. Uh, and we invested in four out of five of them. Uh, and so just to kind of quickly go through a few examples, I mean, Facebook, uh, I think that uh, uh, Greylock's investment in Facebook is pretty well known. Uh, you know, investing, I think like the thing that you'll see through a lot of these examples is investing the very early nascent stages of a, of a growing community until it becomes like this large enduring business. So Facebook, seven million users to the one and a half billion it is today. Uh, LinkedIn, you know, actually one of our partners is that Reid Hoffman, who was the founder and CEO of LinkedIn, now the executive chairman. Um, we did the Series B when it was, you know, a little over 1.2 million users. Uh, more recently, Airbnb uh, is a company that we again invested in uh, when it was, you know, one of these like very controversial ideas of like WTF. Someone would actually do this. Uh, we led that Series A, uh, and now, as you guys know, it's bigger than any hotel chain in the world. Um, and my story is is pretty similar. So I started my career uh, actually in venture capital at a venture firm called Bessemer Venture Partners, where I invested all over the map, software as a service, I was looking at systems management software, e-commerce, and then of course consumer, uh, and ended up investing in Pinterest when it was you know, a four or five person company, 30,000 users, um, and, uh, and got so excited about the company that I joined it, uh, which is pretty atypical. I imagine there's not that many founders that wants to hire their investor, but uh, I uh, luckily snuck in, um, and by the time I left Pinterest, it was about 650 people, uh, and I was leading uh, product on the search, recommendations, machine vision, pin quality team, um, also made a few acquisitions. But you know, when I joined, when I invested in Pinterest, it was, I think, I'm pretty sure it was about 30,000 registered users. When I left, it was 100 million monthly active users. Um, and so, you know, something that I've been thinking about, something that everybody in my firm thinks about, which is how do you spot the very beginning of something, the company that can become one of those enduring multi-billion dollar businesses. Like, it's incredibly, incredibly hard uh, to know. And really, like, you, you know, in the beginning, uh, there's not really a lot of numbers to show you this, right? So it's kind of this combination of art and science. Um, the art, I call it, is like knowing how products work and, and being able to look into the product and really understand how it's, like what all the edges are to help it kind of become one of these enduring multi-billion dollar businesses. And then the science, of course, the science that you lean more towards as a company gets more mature is, is the numbers. Like, 
you know, when a company is six months old, you can't just look at retention because there's not enough users who have been there for six months. When it's four years old, you can look at retention, right? Because you have cohorts. But so it's kind of this thing where the earlier, it's really about product. And that's what I'll be talking about a lot here. Um, and at the core, as I mentioned, uh, it really comes down to understanding how a product is built to both um, grow, because it's something that will have engaged users that get value out of the product, uh, and also um, kind of stick, become better over time. Uh, and actually, I'm giving my punchline away. Um, so uh, I call it the hierarchy of engagement. Um, so the first level with this hierarchy, and I'll talk about each of these, these levels, uh, is what I call growing engaged users. And this, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, engagement is a fuel powering these enduring multi-billion dollar businesses. So if you think about this first level, it's like the gas, it's like the little gas line that you need to create the spark in the engine. Like if you don't have this first level, you're fucked. Like you just better, you know, like there's, you can't build a multi-billion dollar business if you don't have this first level that just keeps on growing over time. But the second is that you have to retain those users. You have to have a product that will that will that is built to be sticky. Uh, and the third is that, and this is like the hardest to to get to. It's the third. It's the third level, but it, that it's self perpetuating. And so what I'll do is talk about virtuous loops in the product um, that make a product and a company self perpetuating. And so if you can if you can hit those three levels. I think you've got an incredible chance at building one of these iconic businesses, uh, and I'll talk about I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth. Um, so, uh, so level, by the way, am I talking too fast? Talking too slow? Is good? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, numero uno, growing engaged users. Okay, so you guys probably have all these questions right now about how do I growth hack my product? How like I hear I have to hire a growth hacker. Um, you know, this is the topic du jour uh, in Silicon Valley. Like this is, you know, in late 2012. Like it just has been this thing that everybody's searching Google for right now. Um, and of course, like you know, the fact is, getting growth is hard. Don't get me wrong. Um, but a lot of companies have growth early on, uh, and that growth comes in in many different forms. Uh, and really, what matters at the end of the day is not growth of users, it's, it's what I call growth of users completing the core action. Um, so what is a core action? The core action is the action that your users complete <coughs> that is the foundation of your product. Without, that, without users completing that core action, you don't have a product. So what would Pinterest be without <coughs> pinning? You know, what would Twitter be without tweeting? Even YouTube, you know, it was interesting. I was, Thinking about well, what's YouTube's core action? Is it is it uh, watching a video? Is it like doing something else about a video? But no, like YouTube would not exist if people weren't uploading videos into YouTube. And actually, a lot of what YouTube did so right and was responsible for their like incredible growth early on was that they figured out all these um, kind of nuances in the UX to make it really easy to upload content into YouTube. Um, and and um, and, and it's important to say here, like I got some, um, had some good conversations that, you know, this doesn't mean that you only, like, you only focus on how do you, like, on the core action, because there's always this ladder of engagement, which is that, you know, to start on Pinterest, you, if, if, you, if we drop you into Pinterest and we say, go pin, like, you're not going to pin, like, you need to add your profile and, create your first board and maybe follow some people, and then we'll get you pinning, and that's when the flywheel really starts to, to move. But at the end of the day, like the thing that is most important is tracking users completing the core action. Um, and, and the way I think about it is that it's kind of like when you, when, you, when you get to grow really quickly and you have all these people downloading your app and um, you're, you, know, you feel really good, if people, if you're not actually also increasing people completing the core action, it's kind of like the empty calories of, of, of growing your, your company. Like, it feels good, but it's not good for you. Um, and so, core action, like, what is your core action? And then, are you growing the percentage of users who are completing that core action? Are you growing 
your base of users complain the core action. And then ultimately, when I as an investor, at the very early stages of looking at a company, the question I ask myself is, all right, the core, what's the core action for this product? And will that core action scale to enough users? So I don't know if any of you guys have read um, Hooked by Nirial or are familiar with the, the um, kind of fog behavior model, but he talks about you have like motivation on one axis and ability on the other axis. And in order to get someone to actually do something, the core action in this case, it has to be, you know, it has to kind of cross that trigger point, that, that kind of activation energy point. And so there are some, some products where you're just like, gosh, like, it's cool for this very small number of users, but are enough people gonna, gonna be able to get over this motivational hump or the ability <coughs> hump? Like, that's, that's something that's always in the back, in the back of uh, your mind as an investor. But, um, but I can tell you it's really freaking hard to tell, both as a, as a founder and an investor. I mean, I, there are so many examples of curves that look just like this, and the VC investment is right here, you know? Like, that is, um, that is uh, it's, it's, it's so hard because when a company is going through this hyper growth, they're, the, they're adding new users so quickly that you can't actually look at any data to tell you what's really happening, right? And so it really is not about the science, as I talked about, it's about the art of really understanding the product and then asking yourself, is this something that people are getting enough value out of to actually do, um, and is it easy enough for them to do? You know, here, you know, Pinterest, um, of course, hindsight's 2020. Um, but when I looked at Pinterest in 2011, there were obviously a lot of things working really well. Um, one was that I felt like there was a very clear value exchange. I happen to be uh, an obsessed user. I have several thousand pins at this point. Um, but like, you know, when I was looking at the product, like there was just something very clear to the utility of Pinterest that really resonated. Um, then you had compounding growth. It was one of those things that every week it was growing around the same percentage. Um, but that compounds over time. Uh, and then the last was that the people complaining the core action was a very big majority of the users that they were adding. So even though the base itself was quite small, it was very clear that there was something really working. Um, and that's what you want to see as an investor and um, what you hope to see <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a founder. And for what it's worth, like, I believe that oftentimes the best communities take time to build. That is not the type of thing where <coughs> you can just go like crazy and then you have like a healthy community. It's very much that the, the best, oftentimes the best communities take time, take time to build and it's getting people consistently to complete the core action. Any questions on core action? Should I keep on doing questions at the end or I, I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. How does that multiple core action in a product? Okay, so the question was, is it possible to have multiple core actions in the product? I don't think so. I actually will say no. Um, I think that you really have to, it, it's like the hardest thing, which is to say, what is the action that I, at the end of the day, I need my users to create? Um, and there should, I, I really believe there should only be one action. Like at Pinterest, we actually talked about clicking through as well as, as repinning um, or pinning. And, and, um, and interestingly, like when we looked at the data, people who clicked through in a given week and returned the, would have the same likelihood of returning the next week as people who repinned. But at the end of the day, like what creates our interest, or what creates like everything that is Pinterest, it's pinning. Um, and so I would really push you to figure out what's the one. Action is the same as an intention. So Do I think core action is the same as an intention? Like an intention. So we have a tool that lets you do routine work. And if you intend to start doing it, we consider that as a core action. Is an intention the same as an action? So I intend to book somewhere to stay, is Airbnb, right? It reminds me of that Yoda quote, like, there is no try. Um, you know, like, I, um, I think that you actually, I, I mean, it could be like committing to an intention. Is, is part of it, but I, that, that, I would worry that that doesn't actually um, create anything in your system. And maybe you, you, raise, you raise a good question. 
which is that the core action is the thing that is going to be uh, creating the energy for these next two these next two phases. So um, when I talk about retaining users, when I talk about self self perpetuating, those two things are both fueled by your core action. And so I think that both for your question on can you have more than one core action and, and your question on, on attention, um, maybe you should maybe tell me ask me that same question if you have it at the end of the presentation. But I think what you'll what you'll see is that it needs to be an action because that's the thing that creates a flywheel in your product. Um, either to create a stickier product over time or to kind of uh, grow the product, re-engage people into the product. Um, so it, ha and it has to be a real action. Yeah. Can the core value actually mature and change as the product grows? Can, can, can you say it again? Uh, can the core value change as the product matures? That yeah. Means, can like, the core Facebook probably used to be at friends, now it's like, well, like posts. So the question is, can you can you change your core action over time? Facebook, you ask, like, was ad friends? Maybe now it's post. So I actually think Facebook will and always will be ad friends. Um, I think Snapchat may be the closest example of a product that may have changed the core action a little bit. But to me, it's still about this idea of like taking something and sharing it. It's just instead of sharing it to people individually, you're just sharing it to everybody. So it's a little bit of a change, but I think it's a lot of the same. Um, yeah. So you mentioned Snapchat specifically with taking a snap and sharing it. Is that two things, or do you consider those the same action? A snap, action? You, like. Because if you snap. Well, tree, no one hears it doesn't. That's snap. right. Yeah. So, but I mean, there are products out there. For example, ours are you actually interact with a virtual object, and then you can do that alone on your own, or you can either share that or go out to the retailer. So we'll so. talk about that. That's user value versus network value. We'll talk right. about that. Um, but Snap, like, you don't, there's no point in taking a Snap if you're not sharing it with anybody. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned non-transactional products. Yes. So uh, can you uh, explain like, why this couldn't be applied to transactional products like Airbnb, over time business trusts and figures and all that? And then also, like, how do you define transaction? Yeah. Um, so I think you'll see when I talk about uh, the next couple of phases, next couple of levels, while why I limit it to non-transactional businesses. I think for, um, I think there's, they're very different products. Transactional businesses are about, um, they're about a value exchange, but it's not, it's a transaction instead of engagement. Um, so I think, I think they're, they're pretty different. Maybe I'll press on and then we can kind of move back to other questions. Um, okay, so retaining users. So, you know, great. We've got uh, we've got in, we've got this growing base of engaged users, and now the big question is, like, this is a, a I hear this question all the freaking time. Like, well, will will people stick? You know, how do you know if people will stick? Um, and this is why it matters. So, uh, two companies completely made up numbers. One company is growing five million new users per month. The other one, two and a half, so twice the, the growth rate. Um, and company A has 80% monthly retention, which I gotta tell you is pretty quick and good. Um, but company B is just like 95%. Like that's that's uh, very rare, um, but uh, but possible. So after six months, uh, if you invested in company A, you would be patting yourself on the back. You'd be like, I, I, made, a good, I made a good decision here. I'm doing really well. Um, but what happens is that after, really it's after 12 months, uh, the churn of company A catches up to it. And basically then every month, they're losing the same number of people that they're, they're gaining. Um, whereas for company B, like you, you know, you would feel really good about that kind of slow and steady um, focus on the core action, like really, really um, building an enduring business. And so <clears throat> when you know how important retention is, then the question is like, well, how do I know if I'm building a product that will retain users? And as an investor, how do I know when I'm looking at a company whether I believe that the company will have a good chance of building a, a sticky product? Um, and the way I think about it is accruing benefits and mounting loss. And so accruing benefit, like 
the idea here is that the more I use a product, the better it should get for me. Uh, so let's talk about Facebook. Um, Facebook, I can make the product better for me in a couple different ways, like explicitly. I can uh, friend someone, I can unfriend someone, I can follow someone, right? Um, so Facebook has a product, I mean the brilliance of newsfeed was that it was creating a accruing benefit in this very tangible way. Um, but it also, there's like implicit things that I do that Facebook takes into account to make the experience better for me the more I use it. So what I click through on, um, what when I'm in the news feed I read, like whose profile I go to and look at their photos. <coughs> Facebook takes all that information and makes the news feed more and more personalized for me so that the more I use the product, the better it gets for me. <coughs> At the same time, like there's this thing of mounting loss. So the more I use the product, the harder it is for me to quit. Um, you know, and, and this is like I think that this is kind of like a metaphysical and a physical level. So <clears throat> on Facebook, I have all my friends, I have my photos, I have all this stuff, but it's also my identity. Like you know, I I feel like it's people know me on Facebook, people know me on Twitter, you know. It's, a, it's something that is, becomes an extension of who you are. And when that happens, like you just, it becomes harder and harder to leave. Um, you know, and Evernote is a product that I think a lot about. Um, I don't know how many of you guys use Evernote, but um, it is like, it is an extension of my brain. And the more, like, it's like, I joke that, um, the freemium model is like giving you a taste that you get addicted to because like you save your first note like okay whatever you save your second you start saving like more notes and then all of a sudden you do a search and you get so much value out of Evernote that you realize that the more you use Evernote the more value you get out of Evernote like I forward everything to Evernote now and so now I can never leave like I will have like as long as I live I will pay the subscription to Evernote because it is like, it is just, I'm addicted to it. It has, it's nailed the accruing benefits and mounting loss. <coughs> Sorry, when I talk too long, I get, uh, my voice gets tired. Um, same thing with Pinterest. Like, you use it as a store for your, like, for your bookmarks. The home feed becomes more personalized for you. It's this extension of who I am. Like, if someone asks me, what are my favorite books? Let me send you my, my board on Pinterest. Like, it's where I express myself for this type of a thing. Um, it's really nailed both the accrued benefits and mounting loss. And actually, a lot of the features that I worked on at Pinterest were about increasing this personalization to make the accruing benefits even stronger. On the other hand, like I think about uh, products that kick ass for level one but fail for level two. So I don't know how many of you guys have used Yik Yak or, or Secret, um, but I remember when both launched, and actually I showed the Yik Yak wrap earlier. Um, when both launched, it was like the, the hotness, right? Like it was so much fun to like experience this new like anonymous community. But uh, what would happen with the app is that I would, I would install Secret, I would feel bad about myself because I thought it was a terrible experience to be in an anonymous community. I would delete it, and then two weeks later someone would be like, hey, did you see that thing in Secret? So I would reinstall it, and my experience would be exactly the same as if I had stayed at Secret for those two weeks or not. There was like no persistent identity, like no one, follow, no one was following me and then not following me. Like, it just, it didn't really matter who I was. I could kind of come in and out of this community without any benefit the more I stayed or any loss the more I stayed. Like it was just, it didn't matter. And so for that reason, I think like 100, like these type of anonymity apps are really hard to build enduring businesses. On the other hand, Twitter actually has anonymity. You can create a profile under a fake name, but it, it doesn't have the same problems as these pure anonymity apps because you actually have identity. Um, you have accruing benefits. You get people following you. You start following people. So you get like this better experience. People start to respond to you. You have like a growing uh, kind of follower base. Yeah. Um, and you have mounting loss. Like 
if I close my account on Twitter, then I lose all my followers, which is not something that you would have in secret. Um, so that's kind of the way it plays out. And so just to summarize here, like the I think the trick, like the thing that I look for when when looking at companies is is all right. The more I use this product, how do I have accruing benefits? What's my mounting loss? Um, because I believe that over time that creates a stickier product. And, and again, like most of the time, when I'm evaluating a business, uh, there's just not enough data to to be able to look at the numbers. You have to look at the product and ask yourself. And I think for for you guys, as as uh, you think about building your product, and again, I thought about this a lot at Pinterest when I was working on the discovery stuff. Is how do you build this into your product to make it stickier um, over time? So that's well. Any questions on level two? I can zoom. I can zoom forward. Yeah. So something like this wouldn't apply in the case of Airbnb, which is more transactional. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So the question was like something like this would not apply in a transactional company like Airbnb, and that's that's precisely right. That level two just doesn't really apply for transactional businesses. Yeah. So with the Evernote example, that would not be a transactional business in your mind. I don't think of it as a trans. It's a fair question. Like it is. Um, I don't think of it as a transactional business. Um, and the reason why is that I think of transactional businesses as this thing where you're kind of just like do the transaction out, right? Like I come to this and do the transaction, but Evernote is actually a thing that you're you're spending time and you're engaging. So you they monetize me not through advertising but through subscription. But to me that doesn't mean it's a transactional business. Yeah. So Airbnb feedback wouldn't be considered for the render or the uh, the question is, so for Airbnb, feedback wouldn't be considered. I think I think that's a great point. Like and, it would and, be. And, and listing, right? Like you've created the listing, so you're not going to go to like the RBO or right. something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a fair, fair point. I, one of the things I want to do is think about what this hierarchy would be for. Like I think the way I, I think about it is that um, this level does actually exist, but it's like thin. It's like very thin, and it's not. It's kind of like Uber also has stars, right? But at the end of the day, like it's just such a narrow part of the product that I don't think about it too much. Yeah. So uh, for something that's kind of in the middle between transactional uh, and more experienced, I guess, we're, we're doing a lot of stuff like machine learning so we understand our yeah. consumers better, we give recommendations, but they don't see that necessarily directly like your like with your friends feed it's your experience gets better over time so it becomes kind of more of a gut feel would you see that similarly? I'll talk about that I was helping you to segue yeah thank you oh that's thank you thank you <laughs> all right so look, let's do it um, all right so we've got engaged users and we have what hopefully is a sticky product um, and so now the question is like whether this engagement you have of your existing users. You know, like you have all these users that are engaging, they're completing the core action. And you can think of it as like they're like pushing energy into your product, right? And some of that energy is returned to them by like the product becoming more and more personalized to them. Um, but there's another thing that can happen with the best products that takes this energy and kind of uses it to create virtuous loops in the product that, that, that I call like propel a product forward. Um, so the strongest virtuous loop is a network effect. Um, and there's two types of network effects here actually. So I talk about um, here like this classic network effect of you know more you get more people to pin in Pinterest, they bring more content in, so the discovery experience is better, and it's, and then more people pin, and it's like this incredible virtuous loop. The same thing is true actually with machine learning. So <clears throat> I could have had more users pin, better interest graph, better personalized recommendations, right? Like that is also another type of network effect that Pinterest enjoys. Um, <clears throat> And but there are like other types of virtuous loops. So actually, though, you know, when we talk about growth, it really should be this, which is that a user, you know, completes like completes an action, gets value out of the product, and either wants to tell another user about it, or actually finds, in, in the case of Pinterest, something that they think is relevant, and it's like, oh, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna send this pin to my friend Molly because um, I think it's relevant. And then Molly sees the pin, she's like, oh, what's this Pinterest thing? That's cool. Comes back to Pinterest, creates an account, and then does the same thing. Um, or similarly, re-engagement. Like every product, it's truthfully more like a company A than company B. Like every company has churn, and the really good companies figure out how to re-engage those users. Um, and so for Pinterest, the thing that we had, which was like this, you know, the advantage that you could never really predict, but ends up being really wonderful, is that if a user repins something, that pin that they repinned was pinned by someone else. And sometimes that person actually hasn't been to Pinterest for a couple of weeks. So they repin something, they're like, oh, we sent a push notification to the person who got repinned, and that person comes back to Pinterest. Um, so it's like these nice virtuous loops where you have people completing the core action or just doing other activities on the site, and those things create this like incredible flywheel spinning, um, making the discovery experience better, growing the product, and re-engaging the product. <coughs> and as you guys probably uh, would guess, like this is really freaking hard. Um, <coughs> It's something um, that almost all companies try to do, but it's really freaking hard to have it happen natively in the product. <coughs> so we talked about user value versus network value earlier. And think about Evernote. You know, Evernote is like a single player product, like as freaking good as it is, like, and they have tried so hard. Like I can't tell you how many times I've tried to press create new note and then I accidentally press like chat I'm like, why would I ever chat with someone in Evernote? Like, it's just not how I use Evernote. They have like collaborative projects. They have all these things, but at the end of the day, like, there aren't any. Like, they just maybe like they just haven't executed on that perfectly yet, or maybe I'm just an outlier. But I think that Evernote's product is much more about user value than these virtuous loops. Um, and so that means that Evernote will have to like spend money to kind of keep people. Uh, coming in, so it's not quite self-perpetuating in the way that like a product that has these natural virtuous loops would be perpetuating. Another example is um, any online dating site, but uh, I pick on Tinder because, uh, as some people joke, this may not actually be true for Tinder. But so, so Tinder has like you know virtuous loops, like you. Um, if I match with someone on Tinder, it sends a notification to that person, re-engages them. So, so there are some virtuous loops. But the most important virtuous loop, which is that you match with someone and then you have a successful date. Like what you would love to have happen is that you're like, oh, the product works. I become a more engaged user, I have the matches, successful date, like that would be that would be amazing. But actually the way it should happen in real life is that you have a successful date and then you're like, oh, I don't need Tinder anymore. Um, and so that's why like on online dating sites like are machines at acquiring people because they constantly have people naturally churning, right? It's part of the system and so they, you know, it's an, like when the product is successful, it's actually an off ramp for the product, not this like re engagement loop, if that makes sense. Um, and so when you, when you have virtuous loops, um, it's just the most powerful thing for the company, and like your, pro your, your, your product will just be propelling itself forward, and your company will constantly be trying to keep up with the growth that just happens naturally in your product. Of, all these users coming in, putting energy into your product, putting like basically fueling your products to like create all these these flywheels. So, so that's it for the hierarchy. I'm going to talk about how you measure this stuff, but let me pause and talk virtuous loops. So any any questions on this side? Okay. So okay, we talked about three things. We talked about Growing engaged users, uh, retaining users, virtuous loops, and and so what that ends up kind of being over time. Um, I realize I've swapped virtuous loops and self-perpetuating, but regardless, like what this actually means over time is that a, an investor wants to see like, hey, this thing is growing. New users are continuing to be engaged in the product. Um, they're doing the core action. 
um, they're retaining those users, and the product is self-perpetuating. That like somehow they figured out how to grow the product, and like you can see how it's going to get, um, you know, some kind of moat over time. And so the best way that I know how to measure that is is with cohorts. Is everybody familiar with the concept of the cohort? Okay. Um, so, so the cohorts that I like to look at is a uh, number of weekly users completing the core action. At Pinterest, we call them wars, uh, weekly active repinners, and that was like the thing that we we tracked. Like that was our you know top line metric every week. I get an email: how many wars do we have? Um, it is the most like if we focus on mouse, uh, we would you would just like you would just be building a not an interesting company. You know, like, but the thing that was most important to us was people repinning and, and tracking you, the number of users for each successive cohort who are doing that over time. And then you also want to look at where the percentage of new users, where the, for each cohort, if you have the denominator be number of people who registered, what percentage of those people are actually completing the core action? So in a way, you have like the numerator and the denominator here. Um, you can see over time, are, are, are we getting better at engaging users or worse? And are we growing that base of people completing the core action? Because at the end of the day, the people completing the core action is the fuel in your, in your engine. And so <clears throat> what this ends up meaning is that you see three things, which is you see uh, the size of each cohort that's growing over time. You see the ratio of users completing the action. Uh, and you see retention, you can, you can track people complain uh, things over time. And there's <clears throat> people visualize cohorts in three different ways. Um, I personally, uh, at the very early stages, I find this one to be the easiest way to visualize cohorts because I find like with something like this, I don't know, my brain just doesn't work as well when I see different colors versus it's just like these lines over time. But then by the time you're the size of Pinterest, you can't look at either of these. You have to look at something like this to help you to help you track things. Um, and so I think that, like, you know, in the beginning stages of a company, like, you just don't have statistical significance to to really track cohort performance. But over time, as you scale, it really becomes, to me, I think, like, if you and I ever meet, and you know, I talk about your company, you can bet that the first question I'm going to ask, if I think you have enough scale, is what do your cohorts look like? Um, I think that you, for your business, you should be, this is like, I think the, you can't hide if you track your cohorts, you know? Like, you know exactly what's happening with your business, and it's as far from a vanity metric as we can. Um, so, we talked growing engaged users. You can do it. Retaining users, self-perpetuating. Uh, and, and the goal. Uh, and so just to close, you know, I really believe that um, you've got to focus on engagement. Uh, it is, you know, we have a very healthy emphasis on growth, but if you lose sight of what the actual fuel is in your, in your product, um, you'll, you just won't get that far. Um, and when you look at all of the, like, most important Non-transactional companies. They, I really believe that they all have, all have these three, these three levels. Um, so that's it. Uh, I can take questions or. Oh yeah. Darn, I hope I was going to get away with no questions. Actually, let me turn mirroring back on. Okay, two, all right, I'll knock off the two online and then gives you a little chance to ask your hardest question. Um, okay, is there a way to evaluate scalability of core action without larger use, uh, user base? Um, so yeah, that's the thing I talked about uh, earlier with the FOG behavioral model, um, which is, I mean, it's, it's, there's, not an, there's not a numerical way to evaluate this, um, but there is this, um, oops, yeah. And this question you have to ask yourself, which is, uh, is it? 
this guy. Uh, do you think that there are enough users who have both the ability and the motivation to complete the core action? Um, and one way to help you understand that is by one, number one, looking at your product and trying to see like who are the people signing up right now and using the product? Is that a broad enough swath of people? Um, but the second thing is just to go out and do user research. Meet with people and see like across these two axes, do they get motivated enough to complete the action? Um, okay, second question. In a traditional media, like an old school newspaper, is the core action, oh, this is, core action, reader subscriber growth or advertiser growth? So it's always like, you don't need, if, if you don't have users, you don't have advertisers. If you have advertisers, it doesn't mean you have users. Um, so it's always about uh, the users, the core, um, the people, the consumers that are actually using your product. Where you have users, the advertisers will follow. Um, all right, any questions here? Yeah. So, um, so for uh, products that do not quite have that level two engagement, yeah. as by image of it, uh, some products still try to build it you know, by points, like travel websites will give you points if you use the same website or flights with you. Yeah. Do you think there's still like value in trying to build it so that the more you do, you're somehow locked in, not that core of the product? Yes. I, I definitely, I mean, especially, you know, one of the challenges often with transactional, with travel, is that it's actually commodity products, right? Like, the, the <coughs> supply is fungible. Whether you buy your ticket on Delta.com or Kayak or Expedia, it doesn't matter. Or whether you take a Delta flight or American Airlines, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter. So, so you have to use, it, it, then your only mechanism is quality and price, um, and really becomes about price. Uh, and so using another mechanism is, is always worthwhile. Okay. Uh, yes? What is it, on our product, is it possible that user behavior might be seasonal, as in they might come in like this month, and then drop off, but then come again in the same month again, and then stay a very loyal, like it's only a particular time frame. Is that, well, um, I missed the very beginning of your is question. It, is, is it, it possible? possible? Yeah, is it possible for user behavior to be seasonal? Oh, yeah, sure. Is it possible for user behavior to be seasonal? Um, yeah, of course. Um, that that, um, that makes it hard to build a business, uh, though. Like, um, it, means, it means when, when, when uh, behavior tends to be seasonal, oftentimes that means that the um, spacing between each engagement is, is far enough away that you basically, you get forgotten in the minds of the user, and so you have to reacquire the user each time. Um, so, but it's definitely possible. I think in the, um, yeah, it's definitely possible. Yep. Yes, um, so I can understand why is the transaction always not in Google, because the action is defined. Right. So what if there are sites like Coursera, they have transaction stuff, but also they are building a community. Like, does for action, for zeros will still apply? How does that action? Now, I don't know Coursera's business well enough to comment. Um, uh, so I, I just don't know their business well enough. But I would think yes, that it applies. Um, when I, yeah, I, I just I shouldn't comment on Coursera, but I just don't know their business. Um, we can talk, I can check it out after. Right, sure. Um, all right, I'm going to do a couple other. Uh, at Pinterest, what was the proportion of Pinterest pinners versus consumers? Uh, do I find the split to be traditional 1990? So, for some people, for, I actually don't remember what the, so there's people who create the content. People who send it for engagement. Okay. Um, so, no, uh, ours was far, far better. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't give more than that. But uh, I think that that is. You know. I think that part of the magic of um, newer products is that they've made the core action simpler and simpler and more and more core to the product. So that it's no longer the case that that. I actually think that that's probably an antiquated uh, rule of thumb um, because increasingly 
products are all about engagement, right? Like, there aren't Yelps anymore where there's like a small, small, small percentage of people who write reviews and then everybody else reads. Um, those products are actually fewer and far between nowadays. Um, uh, any other examples of virtuous loops? Uh, well, I think that there's um, the machine, you know, there's uh, classic network effects, there is uh, machine learning, so actually using the data that users give you to make the product better. I think this is probably, when you think about the future of consumer companies, I think that that's really one of the most important virtuous loops fuel, uh, fueling these companies. Um, and there's, you know, growth, re-engagement. Um, any other questions here? Yeah. So the, uh, you know, when you talk about engagement, uh, kind of on that seasonality, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of you know, successful companies, Kayak, for example, if you're booking flights, that they have that hook. Is there other things, for example, like a Kayak could be doing outside just sending you an email notification every month? that you would think would kind of build out that virtual cycle? No, I, 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 um, I think first of all, Kayak is a transactional business. Right. Um, so it doesn't quite fit here. Um, and I think also that Kayak's, um, the challenge with a company like Kayak or travel in general is that you can't predict when someone's gonna travel. Um, so you just kind of have to have um, enough of the acquisition costs working so that you get people coming. But in terms of, yeah, I think that's pretty hard. It, the types of things that they, they do have little features that they try to do this, like you can set an alert for like, hey, I always, I'd always i love to go to Vegas, but I'll only go to Vegas if the price is 200 bucks or less. And then if there's like some amazing deal that comes out, I get an email, it's like, oh, I could do that. But those, those offer, like I've got to imagine that the percentage of people who actually use that feature is Super, super small basis points. Yeah. Do you ever think of your hierarchy as a diagnostic tool? Um, and if you do, then um, I think maybe all the press that was happening around like the downfall of Twitter was maybe a little after you wrote your articles. Potentially. Or maybe yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So, any thoughts on Twitter? And it's less about their kind of their business side of making revenue and just more about kind of where they, I mean, they exited. It. They did really well, but then now they're experiencing some issues. Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, great question. So I think um, I do think like I use it as a diagnostic tool in a way when I'm meeting with a company because I, I like I realized I was actually doing this subconsciously, and then I had to give a presentation on engagement, so I put it in paper. I was like, oh, this is what I'm actually doing when I'm evaluating a business. I'm going almost diagnostically through these levels to see whether how the company um, shakes out. But you know, Twitter is really interesting. So I think um, one of the core challenges that people talk about for Twitter is this guy, right? Like, they have so many people. Um, it's it's actually it's it's a it's a combination of all three of these. I can I can pinpoint from a diagnostic perspective each of these levels. So number one, um, people who sign up for Twitter don't understand the value of it, and so they don't tweet. And if they don't tweet, you're growing users, but you're not growing users who are completing the core action. And and now they're not even they're not even getting new people signing up. So they actually, I'm pretty sure they talk about MAUs as their metric, which is not the metric that I hope they use internally to track their, their success because it's really gotta be about people sending tweets, right, at the end of the day. Um, and then this one too, like it's interesting, all the conversation about Twitter, all the backlash for Twitter doing the algorithmic feed, um, I thought it was really interesting because ultimately that is such an accruing benefit, right, of making the product better for you the more you use it. Like they were just depending on all these users understanding how to use the product and only doing the explicit functions of, of follow and unfollow. Imagine if that was Facebook's news feed. Like, you would just get so much less value out of Facebook if the only way you could tune your home feed was by unfollow, like unfriending people or unfollowing people. And that's what Twitter is. And so I'm so happy that they finally shipped that, that feature because I think that that was a really important thing for them to do. Um, but, uh, 
But at the end of the day, for Twitter, it's really about it's really about this guy and having people understand why the heck they should uh, write a tweet. Yeah. Um, in terms of finding, you're gonna have to speak up. Uh, in terms of finding more action for your product, what, what advice would you have for the products? Online stuff like dashboards and like Google Analytics, what would their core action be? Well, Google Analytics is on the B2B side, so uh, I'm talking specifically about B2C, but so the question was like, how do you figure out what your core action is, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> were you asking like if you can figure it out in Google Analytics? Yeah. Or were you just giving Google Analytics yeah, as an example? example? Okay, so yeah, that's B2B. Um, although, I don't I, I don't know what the core action would be. I don't I don't know if it applies as much to B2B. I think he was but, saying for a dashboard. So maybe use the analogy of mint.com. Uh, mint.com was mint.com was essentially a dashboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah what or, was there? Yeah. Or like mixed panel or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a well it's and mixed panel. So but I like mint as an example because it's a it's a consumer it's a consumer dashboard. Mm -hmm. Um I've gotta imagine I, I actually use Mint, and I, I like it a lot. Um, then you're right for, it could be that for Mint, by the way, Mint is a great example uh, for two reasons. What Mint shows at the core action is not you have to set the user up to have the core action. So you could say, isn't Mint connecting my bank account? But no, that's not, I don't think that's what the core action is. That sets the user up to have a successful experience in the app. Um, but maybe maybe the core action for Mint is just checking in. Um, and I think that that is probably, I mean, they certainly don't have self-perpetuating, right? It's very much like a user value thing. Um, but I think that that's probably one of the weaknesses of Mint, is that there was never anything you could act on. Um, to like, they had lead gen stuff, and maybe that's how they would describe their core action. Like, they want you to probably act on some of the recommendations that they give you. Like, that gives you more value out of the product, and so therefore, like, you're more engaged in the Like, maybe they would talk about that. I actually think it's often hard from the outside to know what a company's core action is because you don't really know what the strategy is. And I think the most important thing is that. I think that you'll find when you analyze your users that people who complete the core action are the most likely to return the next week. Um, that's like what we found at Pinterest that like, you know, for people who repent, also people who click through, but really for people who repent, they, out of every other thing you could do on Pinterest, and there are a lot of things you can do on Pinterest, if you repent, you're coming back next week. Um, and so I would be, I don't know, it's, I, don't, I would, I think from the inside you'd have to know, how, you would have to ask me from the inside, but. I think they got bought at level two. Yeah. And then, it, then they became lead gen for into it. Probably. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. We have one last question. Is that a burning question? Anybody's got a burning question? Um, yeah, yeah. Why don't you start market? So if you found a core action, I don't know, I guess your experience of interest, how would you manage that different uh, jurisdiction, different? Like say South America versus North America versus Asia, or was it pretty much the same? It was just tweaking the message accordingly. Yeah, well, it was um, the action was the same, but uh, making sure that the content created the conditions for the action. So what we would look at is propensity then to complete the core action. We didn't call it the core action, but propensity to complete a repin. And so in the United States, like the propensity to complete a repin was very very high. So a user sees a pin. What's the probability that they'll repin that pin? Super, super high, which means that the relevance of that content is very high. When you go to Japan and you're showing US pins, your propensity is going to be very, very low. And so a lot of the work that we have to do internationally, or I shouldn't say we anymore, but a lot of the work that Pinterest is doing internationally now is getting the right content to increase that propensity. Okay.
I got the address. So, okay, your example of Yelp or say YouTube, which has fewer users creating content and majority consuming, <clears throat> should businesses like that have two core actions? Um, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you, I mean, look, you have to monitor more than one action, right? Like, I'm not saying that you delete all your dashboards and the only dashboard you look at is people completing the core action because there are so many things that lead to, um, that lead to like a really healthy ecosystem in your product. Um, but ultimately, uh, the thing that I'm talking about here is the thing that is the most foundational action of your product. Uh, and so I think that there can only really be one. Great, thank you so much, you guys.